knocking game, knocking game, find a tree, hear it speak, oaken bones in wind may creak, listen lest it speak its name, and offer succor for the game. Diary of Dr. Cyrus P. Devereaux, 9 o'clock in the evening, July 9th, 1919. A curse on that imbecile who collided his vehicle with a young man I met on the road. Had I not been waylaid in the endeavor of assisting the individual who, thank God, was not severely injured, I would have made good time in reaching the McGinnis residence. Miss Melrose informed me that I missed the birth by mere moments. Fortunately, the proceedings have come and gone, and now the world knows the delightful presence of two beautiful baby girls, Deirdre and Juliana McGinnis, born to Edward and Rachel McGinnis. They seem a fine young couple, him a doughboy safely returned from the great conflict, and she a nurse herself, as I learned, tending such as him in the trenches. I had occasion, once my cursory inspection of the patient and the newborns was completed, to chat some with the father and their good friend, Miss Francine Melrose. A mutual contact, wouldn't you know? Edward soon passed out, joining his wife, Rachel, but through the accumulation of discourse, I learned they had met overseas in a field hospital, taken a shine to each other nearly immediately, and agreed that if they both survived, They'd find each other back home in Mississippi. Providence was kind to them, for their fates have, thus far, been as they designed. In truth, I had no idea the couple had taken up residence in town. That eyesore of an old house has been lingering on that road for years, dilapidated and forgotten. Now, however, I believe I have the identities of those who've been effecting repair on the old place. A property in her family, I believe, dating back two or three generations. The locals have stories about it being haunted by some old witch's ghost or some nonsense like that. Like as not, that will be the cause of its dereliction. Foolish fables. However, I suppose they may help keep the children in line. It will be my good pleasure to follow up with the McGinnises in the near future, and to make better acquaintance with them. Once she is up to it, I am sure the lady of the house will have many an anecdote from the wall to tell about those field hospitals. Rest is the impending prescription. All four of them, babies and parents, seemed healthy and vigorous after my inspection. My only note of concern was the pallor of the wife, as she seemed to have had a harder birth than would be ideal. Again, may the fortunes of the ne'er-do-well that postponed my arrival turn sour and shriveled. One child is odd enough to bear, let alone twins. Mrs. McGinnis is both fortunate and hardy. Half past eight o'clock in the evening, March 2nd, 1921. I return home this night from yet another visit to the McGinnis home. In addition to my regular duties there, Edward and Rachel so generously treated me to supper. Let it not ever be proclaimed that Mrs. McGinnis is a poor hand at cookery, for the fare decorating the table was fit for a king. Shame there was none but me at hand to ensure its proper disposal. Dreadful shame, as I'm sure my waistline will remind me soon. Edward has proven himself a most useful contact. In these dry times, he has managed to procure what seems a cornucopia of spiritous libations. I consider it of paramount importance that I understand the experiences of my patients. It would have been a neglect of my position to turn down the prophet's shine, the enjoyment of which was entirely coincidental and not at all the primary intent of such a research venture. I noted that Edward himself abstained, preferring to keep to his water. That man drinks enough water for three working men. 
granted, even these years into living at their home, much remains to be done, more than enough to work out the thirst. Still, too much of a good thing remains so. The daughters appear to be in good health and spirits. Deirdre, in particular, is quite the little charmer. Not yet two years, and she can hold a conversation that, frankly, surpasses the faculties of a plurality of my patients. Even if her subject matter is still limited to her dolls and imaginary exploits. Juliana does not seem to keep up with her sister's mental development, but it could also be as she's just shy. It is utterly adorable how she'll hide behind her own curls when one addresses her. I hope I did not frighten the poor girl. Mrs. McGinnis remains a stalwart promontory against the howling winds with which motherhood batters her. Her color has never completely returned since the birth. I've suggested sundry remedies, recorded in earlier entries within this book. Some have elevated or lowered her energy levels, but none have returned her to normalcy. In part, I blame this prohibition nonsense. The abuse of a perfectly sound commodity has robbed responsible folk of the opportunity to partake in appropriate amounts. Edward's acquisition of his stash seems a recent development, and I hope the supplementary spirit will, taken occasionally, return a ruddiness to those cheeks that has long been lacking. Nine o'clock in the evening, September 3rd, 1921. Mrs. McGinn has had an unfortunate bout of sickness. I have only just returned from tending her myself these past three days. It cost me a follow-up visit to the Thompsons, but I could not in good conscience abandon her or her family while her health remained uncertain. At last today, she was able to keep down some solid food, and the fever, while still present, has reduced enough to calm my nerves. Her color is the worst I've seen it since the birth. Whatever bout of illness this is, I'm supposing it to not be contagious. Edward has remained by her side when not working, and seems to share none of her symptoms. However, he does concern me for other reasons. His predilection for the excessive consumption of water has waxed, not waned. I observed noticeable distension of the gut, merely from water absorption. Yet when I inquired as to his satiation, he responded that his throat still craved more. I prescribed some extra use of the illicit spirits he has stowed away, hoping that it would calm his mind and, perhaps, aid in the dehydration of that much water. I do not like to prescribe so much of alcohol, but in this extreme circumstance, it feels the least problematic option. Thankfully, the girls, now older than two, are unaffected. Deirdre remains a charmer, as always, and is ubiquitously followed by Juliana. They are as the Earth and the Moon, with Deirdre plotting her course through the solar system, and Juliana unfailingly in her orbit. It was my privilege to tuck them into bed this night, as their parents were too fatigued. The crib, I noted, is in danger of becoming too small very soon. I expounded on this subject to the girls as they were inserted. Juliana, in a rare moment of being outgoing, told that she would not want to leave this vessel, that it whispered sweet comforts to them as they slumbered. Deirdre told her that I didn't need to hear such silliness, that grown-ups couldn't understand the games they played. Ah, to be that young again, and to draw joy from simple games and arbitrary sources. As I left the room, the two pretended to be asleep but I could hear their hushed whispers and gentle raps on the wood of their crib while walking away. Before descending the stairs, I looked in again on the couple. Rachel lay sound asleep in the bed, with Edward resting his head on the rocking chair beside her, no more conscious than she, their hands intertwined. When I had escorted the girls out merely a moment before, the two had been fully awake. It seemed that the presence of the children particularly the outgoing Deirdre, energized their parents in a way that no tonic I have tried worked. I wondered at the possible corollary of this theorem. Perhaps removing the children from their parents' company was a mistake. 
and that it wilted whatever gains had been made by their entry. In my career, I have seen heartache and heart sickness turn a patient's condition either better or worse as events would have it, but rarely in so starkly visible a fashion. Evening of July 10th, 1922 I am at my wit's end. The McGinnises, a kinder, nobler, more generous couple than you could hope to serve, have continued to spiral, though I now see in my oldest diary entries the seeds of what has grown. In truth, it began in earnest September of last year, when Rachel McGinnis took ill. I've described elsewhere the precise nature of her fever and digestive symptoms, as well as her improvement, but that illness damaged her beyond full recovery. To date, she rarely stands for more than a few minutes at a time, and in spite of the inactivity that results, remains thin as a twig. At my insistence, she eats enough for a battalion, but food does not turn to fat. She gets enough nutrient to subsist, but only so. Her eyes are dim, her complexion like a ghost. Edward's drinking problem has persisted as well. Would that it was simply alcoholism, for that I could properly treat. I've examined him time and again. I prescribed drugs to dull his pain and cease the need for more water. The cause of his excess thirst eludes me. The daughters are to remain within eyesight and earshot of their parents as much as possible. Mr. McGinnis needs must leave them to perform labor, but their mother can be attended by the day. Never have I seen such a case of reliance on the presence of another human to simply keep another human going. With Deirdre chatting away and Juliana playing with her dolls, Rachel looks almost human again. But if they leave for even a few moments, she turns almost gray. Her voice fades to a whisper. Her eyelids droop, no matter her expenditure of effort to maintain the apertures. I fully believe that had she not her beloved daughters, she would be dead already. Possibly her husband, too. I have not witnessed his performance in the factory, but if the glimpses of fatigue I've seen in him while on the McGinnis property are at all indicative, and how he manages not to kill himself on the job, I have no notion. In spite of all my training, all my studies, in the face of everything tangible and scientific the medical profession has instilled in my bones, I cannot explain my reasoning, but I fear that house. Not the people within it, the house. Its timbers, shingles, and foundation. It is perhaps silly to write this down, even delusional. If I do not, I will burst my brain from my skull in consternation. I asked as to the history of the edifice while in attendance recently. The building is not original. Some time ago, the old home was struck by lightning. It burned to the ground, but was rebuilt. Trees around the property were harvested for building both it and the furniture within. Even the little crib that the daughters have now outgrown was made from the lumber. Shortly after its refurbishment, the owners left for different lodging, retaining the deed to the property, but never using it. It goes against my being, but I have to wonder. Might they have left for good reason? Might the young couple, in love and grateful to be alive after the war, have chosen a place to live that ought not... This is silly. That ought not be lived in? Cyrus, you old fool, stop considering such nonsense. You wasted good ink on the musing and even more on this rebuke. There is much we do not yet understand, even in this time of advancement in all fields. But though mysteries remain that we in the present may not unravel, our successes, whether in the next generation or even later, will grapple with these and come out the victors. Eleven o'clock in the evening... April 3rd, 1923. Hollowness within and throughout me, not a strand of vitality remaining. 
I can barely manage to write these words down. Juliana McGinnis has gone missing. It is the fifth night straight of searching for the girl. My eyes are blurring over with exhaustion, and my bones ache with tenfold their normal rancor. We have scoured the McGinnis property, every last blade of grass. We tore through the house itself, from rafters to cellar. The neighbors were all contacted. Search parties went through the woods and fields. Not a sign. Mrs. McGinnis has not awakened since the search began. Mr. McGinnis has not slept since. He trundles along by the searchers, ceaselessly, hoping against hope that the next hill, or the next bend in the road, might hide his darling daughter. I pray that they found her the moment I left their company, truly, for I was of no more use this night. Before the slumber takes me, I want to know that Deirdre has been amazingly helpful. It is as though she senses what her mother and father need. What they need, right now, is not a despairing child to tend. She understands better than many adults that what is needed is faith and vigilance. She stays by her sleeping mother, stroking her hand and fingers. When her father is home, she hugs him tightly, but never cries. Deirdre is nothing less than certain that Juliana will come home, and she imparts all that into her family. Only twice have I seen through her, when she thought none could see. The first time, her hopeful expression soured, and she gently sobbed. The second time, she became angry, stalking back and forth in her room and arguing with herself. What she said I could not make out, but what else could it be but whether or not to give up hope. Oblivion awaits. It will be a welcome interlude. May the next act be joy, not sorrow. Mid-afternoon, April 10th, 1923. I know not why I write these words down. They are jumbles of ludicrous fantasy, written with absurd horror. In sequence and logical structure, they have no possibility of truthfulness. They cannot. And yet, even as I reread these first phrases, I detect that indescribable verisimilitude that no tale or exaggeration possesses. Mr. and Mrs. McGinnis have passed away. I know not the exact times. I do not want to dwell on such a schedule. For if the hour was late enough, and had I risen earlier, no, I must not think so. To dwell on hypothetical changes in decision is a recipe only for regret, and there is enough here to do me ill in deep contemplation without adding more. I arrived this morning at the McGinnis residence to find Deirdre. Little Deirdre, who is nearing her fourth birthday somehow, with tears running from her eyes. Yet her voice did not shake, nor was it raised. She spoke calmly, stoically. At most, she sounded confused. Ma's not breathing. Pa won't get up. Dr. Cyrus, why? I looked into that child's eyes as cold and pain subsumed my insides. Her brown eyes were vacant, it was as though the child within had shut herself away. She refused to feel what the world was causing her to feel, and instead just locked the door in her own head. I found the parents. It was true. Rachel drew no breath. Edward had no pulse. I looked at the quiet child and knew that I must make no expression of grief. She would not allow herself to feel it right then. I would not force it on her, not bring her world tumbling down, as I knew it must have been wont to crash around her. I bade her to come with me to town. We had people we needed to meet, arrangements to make. Miss Melrose, whom I had not seen since that night the twins were born, graciously agreed to tend the child while I contacted the coroner. The bodies were taken away, 
Their wills were on file, thankfully. Though the McGinnises had but little, it would be accounted for. I walked the soil around their house again, after the bodies had been taken. First, the illness that had plagued her mother all these years. Her father's unknown cause of chronic thirst. Her twin sister's disappearance. Her parents' untimely death. I wept for the child. Bitter tears of mourning and shame. I wondered if I had been better, had I known more. But the worst was yet to come. As I wandered around the family home, I came upon a small memorial. The weathered stone had caught my eye once before during the search for little Juliana. However, there had been no time to make proper examination then. I knelt before this monument, reading the small inscription. The stone bore the names Emilia and Marie carved into its face. I brushed my fingertips over the stone, wiping away dirt. For an untended grave marker or other memorial, it was less dirty than I would have supposed. Without knowing what impetus struck my mind to do so, I pushed the stone, intending to lay it on its back. It resisted, but soon enough the stone was prostrate, revealing its underside to me. Carved in the bottom of the stone, legible even through the dirt, was the name Juliana. What washed over me next was not fear. That emotion is an understandable response to an understandable threat. Neither was it terror, an amplified instance of the same thing. I felt something colder, sicker, greasier than fear. It slithered within my stomach as an adder winding through its den. Without conscious thought, my feet took me to the tool shed on the property, wherein I acquired a spade. Again, without thinking to do it, my body returned me to the upturned gravestone where, God forgive me, I dug into the earth. Perhaps it took half an hour, perhaps several hours. It felt both instant and never-ending. Nevertheless, whether the excavation lasted one eternity or one infinitesimal, I reached the contents of the grave. There were three corpses buried. Two were older than I was by the state of their decomposition. One was much more recent, showing not even a week's worth of interment there in the ground, and all three skeletons were no taller than three feet. My stomach had no contents within it to evacuate. Had there been, my morning sustenance would have joined the bones in that grave. How? How could we miss this? There must have been fresh dirt unearthed when we were searching for the child. How could we not have witnessed it? No sooner had I bidden these thoughts than I heard a small giggle behind me. I froze. That giggle was one that had graced my ears countless times in my tending of the McGinnises. It was also one that could not have come to my hearing at that instant. I say this because the issuer of the laughter was currently in the care of Miss Melrose, back in town. There was no way Francine Melrose would have let the remaining McGinnis daughter out of her sight in these circumstances. Though I knew this, and though logic itself argued that what I sensed must have been a fabrication of my turmoil, the truth was inexorable. I had just heard Deirdre giggle. Out of the corner of my eye, something moved. It was too far out of sight to identify. It stood no taller than a cask or a chair or a child. The stillness that had gripped me gave way to fear and anger. I turned, raising my spade overhead in instinct. But there was nothing. Not even a small pair of footprints. My gaze turned thither and yonder. Not a soul in sight. I made to flee the property flee to the sanctity of my own home. I left with one last sensation. As I passed a tree by the drive to enter the property, I heard a trio of small taps on the wood. Three small knocks. <laughs>